But when I saw the people getting attacked and beaten, sprayed, and the fact that they were putting their lives at risk was really amazing. I realized at that point that I couldn't live with myself if I just stood by, because I had been watching like all the Black Lives Matter movement, all the people being killed, and that itself was affecting me. And um, sat my bosses down to give them my 24 hour notice, which was one of the hardest things I've ever done. And not only did they understand, but they contributed and they still lent me their delivery van and allowed me to bake off over 100 loaves of bread and then um, over close to 200 pounds of granola. Daniel Sanchez, originally I'm from San Ysidro, California, like basically the last US exit before Tijuana. My Japanese grandma on my mom's side, uh, she was an atomic bomb survivor in Nagasaki and she was less than a quarter mile away from the impact zone. This is her first train ride alone as a child and went to go visit her brother and as she was walking into the factory, she, all she remembers was a bright orange flash. And the next thing she remembers is getting pulled out of the rubble by soldiers. When she started going back to school, she actually got kicked out, I believe it was in fourth grade, because every morning they would, have, as they entered the school, they'd have to bow to the Emperor Hirohito's mural that they had at the school, and she spit on it because he hid up in his palace while the rest of her family burned in the city. She was talking about when she first came to the States. Um, they were down south because my grandpa was in the Navy, so they moved around a lot. And um, she was telling me a story of going into a restaurant and a big, tall, scary white guy came up and faced her. And then she just stared him right up and down the same way he did to her. And my grandpa had to come and get in between them before it turned into an issue. And she also told me about going to the bathroom. And at that point, they were still separated white and black. And um, she went to the black bathroom for minorities. And it was like, well, where's the yellow bathroom then? And it was just like, really? She's awesome. Like, I love my grandma so much. Her whole life, she suffered from radiation poisoning. She has brittle bones disease. She had breast cancer and had both her breasts taken out. She's had issues with her teeth. She lost those pretty quick. She's got cataracts in her eyes. Just a ridiculously long list of medical problems. But yeah, she's still one of the most beautiful, amazing, strong-willed people I know. On my mom's side, she's half Japanese and half Caucasian. My dad is uh, Chicano and Native American. And then I was just actually talking to one of my uncles today, and he mentioned that my grandma is um, Cherokee and Lakota. Her mom's name was Redfeather and her dad's name was Whitehawk. Because that's another reason why I came out here, is try to connect with my native culture and try to understand it a little bit more. I don't even know where I learned it, but when I was seven years old, I tried to hang myself in my closet with a belt, which is very childish. But my, like my brother found me and caught me and nothing came of it, but that was a rough year for me. That's also when my dad broke his back. It's when I first experienced depression. So our neighborhood was sort of getting gentrified and our rent got hiked up from 900 to 1200. Parents couldn't afford it anymore. So we got evicted and parents split up. A Bunch of stuff happened. I got kicked out of school when I was 15. Mainly because my dad, after he divorced my mom, he went into a really deep depression. He broke his back in 97, so he hadn't been working since then. He's been on pain meds and um, basically kind of took over his life and wouldn't get out of bed, couldn't feed himself, couldn't really use the bathroom on occasion. We'd carry him there and um, gave up on life pretty much. So I was staying home and taking care of him most of the time and still doing my homework. Like I was still participating in school, but because I wasn't there physically, they didn't expel me, they withdrew me from the school and then they had a cop escort me off the property because they're assholes. But um, they also didn't like me previously because they made rules of like no single colors, no chains, no spikes. And like as you see, I have this leather jacket covered in spikes and chains and patches and stuff. I feel they made that rule specifically for me and my buddies because that's exactly the way we would dress. Because I grew up in a really violent society, I felt like I needed to protect myself, and I feel like this is my armor, sort of. Like, it's kind of... It's kind of a shell, really. If they really get to know me, they're gonna know that I'm not threatening. I just don't want people to fuck with me. And so, yeah, I feel like that's kind of why I started dressing like this. My mom and my grandma are very much working-class people. They helped me understand at a young age that we are poor. 
especially the part where she couldn't afford her groceries. That happened a few times growing up. And it was always just so hard for her because then she would start crying and she'd start apologizing to me and just feeling terrible. And at that point, you'd start to realize, like, this isn't normal. And, like, you can kind of see other people, like, sympathizing with you. And also on um, the schools started trying to donate things to us. Like, we'd go to the big community Christmas gift giveaways, which is basically just going into a cafeteria with a line of kids standing in line for an hour to sit on like a Santa's lap, get a candy cane and a random present out of a giant pile of presents. And I remember how all the adults that were behind the tables helping kids were just so stressed out looking. Nobody was really happy at all, like in the entire cafeteria. Everybody was just bummed out, sad and stressed out. After a while it clicks that it's poverty more than anything else. I actually went to seven different public schools throughout my life, so I didn't really have, like, close friends. And so I was one of three Mexicans in the middle school I was going to, and um, we stuck together. And they were, like, straight out of Mexico, too. They didn't speak very much English at all, but we were, like, the only brown ones around, so we just stuck to each other. I was taking Spanish classes, and they were taking English in Spanish class. Like, so it's, it was kind of weird like that. They learn English way better than I learned Spanish. It, it kind of sucks. <laughs> it's kind of embarrassing that I failed three years in a row. I was thinking about this recently. I haven't been in a fist fight in over seven years, which is like amazing to me. My grandpa taught me how to like hold my stance and throw a fucking punch because he was a professional boxer when he was in the army. People just fuck with me and pick fights all the time and for no reason at all. One, one time I, I was a weird kid, so I wore a bike chain on my forehead like people wear bandanas, but instead of a fucking metal bike chain. And uh, one dude was like, oh, are you some fucking Indian or something? And I was like, yeah, you got a fucking problem with it? And we just got in a fight, like right there over that shit. One time about five white supremacists showed up and I was trying to avoid them. I just kept moving to the other side of the park. This is when I was homeless. And um, they ended up like chasing me down and whooping my ass. And at the time, like getting chased wasn't an unusual thing. <laughs> like that's not, that's not out of the ordinary, but that was probably the worst singling out, getting chased and beat by multiple people that I ever experienced. And it was like, they're calling me like a nigger and a faggot and spick and just everything they can possibly, all the rage that they had where they were putting out on me. I curled up into a tight ball. They didn't damage me too much. It was good. Just people, were offended by me existing, basically. And at that point, I wanted to defend myself in a physical way as opposed to just avoiding altercations and being a better person. Growing up, I never expected to go to college because I grew up poor. And honestly, when I was homeless, I didn't expect to live past like 25 or 30. Like, I felt like I was just a burden on all my friends and just a weight, like I wasn't contributing to society in any way. I didn't have a job anymore. I was just done. I was just done with everything, so I collected up a bunch of opiates that I can find, as many as I could find. I think it was only like five of them, but that should have been enough added on top of alcohol. But for some reason, that didn't do it. Like, they still, I still woke up the next day angry, like pissed off, but, but alive. Pretty quick after that, a friend of mine actually did die from just from elements being outside, and that kind of knocked me back into a reality and and then my life sort of started getting better after that too i realized that there is value to everybody's life and that there's i could contribute i just have to get off my ass and get out of the really shitty situation the job i have now i've been at for three years now and they really don't want to see me go i work my ass off so i can like i, I try to impress people in that way if you don't smile, people are going to be scared of you. Or at least maybe because I'm brown and I look scary. But if you don't smile, people are going to like be afraid of you and think you're there to cause trouble and they won't trust you and things like that. So I, I definitely, like I'll put on this, like what you see now, but then when I'm at home alone, like it's just depression. It'll hit me really hard. It's addicting. Like depression feels good. It's weird. It, I mean, that sounds weird to say, but it does. It's It's really easy to just feel bad for yourself and just self-loathing is kind of an addicting feeling and especially when you get sympathy from other people there's other people out there that are struggling so much more than i am that like i have nothing to complain about anymore like right now i'm living so well i'm in a community that 
knows me now and respects me and treats me well. I don't get fucked with by cops as much now that I got glasses. Like, I, I'm serious. Like, as soon as I got glasses, I stopped getting pulled over. It was fucking weird. And all my friends would be like, oh, you're so much less intimidating. It's like, is that a compliment? Like, what are you, like, is that nice? Are you trying to be nice? Like, it's, it's like saying like, oh, with lipstick, you're so much more pretty. It's like, why, why would you, uh, yeah, once I got glasses, I stopped glaring as much. If I didn't have my glasses, I'd have to kind of do that to like get to see people like, oh, hey, what's up? And then they would like from across the street and they would think I'm just like mad dogging them. But really, I'm just trying to see if it's who I think it is. Uh, they also say I look smarter. Like these are not compliments. <laughs> like, these are really insulting to me. <laughs> My grandma's Buddhist, so I did like the only religion I ever practiced was Buddhism, and so they they are always constantly um, reminding you that the universe is all one, and every action there is a reaction, and uh, like if you focus on positive things, you're creating positive energy, and so more positive things are going to be created out of that. Being here just in general is like a cleanse, being a sponge basically, and trying to learn and listen and contribute as much as I can. It's been mostly just prayer and song and people just meeting each other and talking and trying to come up with solutions. And you can tell that they're just trying so hard to make this all work. It's just one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen or heard of.